some years ago, a long time ago actually, I wrote a book called Doves of War, which was a book about four women who lived in the extreme times of the Spanish Civil War. And in that book, I tried to illustrate the extent to which the Spanish Republic gave much to women, and Franco's victory in the Spanish Civil War took away even more. In the five and a quarter years before the right-wing backlash culminated in the military coup of the 18th of July 1936, cultural and educational reform had transformed the lives of both many Spaniards, particularly of women. Before 1931, the Spanish legal system had been astonishingly retrograde. Women were not permitted to sign contracts, to administer businesses or estates, or to marry without risk of losing their jobs. The Republican Constitution of December 1931 gave them the same legal rights as men, <coughs> permitting them to vote, to stand for Parliament, and legalising divorce. Pressure for the female vote had not come from any mass women's movement, but from a tiny elite of educated women and some progressive male politicians most notably in the Socialist Party. Accordingly, much of this legislation was excoriated as godless by a majority of Catholic women influenced by their priests. At the same time, the right was far more successful than the left in mobilizing the newly emancipa emancipated female voters to its cause. Nevertheless, in the period from 1931 to 1936, women of both the left and the right were mobilized politically and socially as never before. They were involved in electoral campaigns, trade union committees, protest demonstrations, and the educational system, both through the massive expansion of primary schooling and the opening <coughs> of universities. Nevertheless, public life remained a predominantly male precinct. The woman rash, en rash enough to put her head over the parapet and intrude upon the patriarchal territory of politics faced accusations of being brazen, and this happened to both Margarita Nelkin, one of the, the women whose biography I wrote in Dublin of War, and Dolores Ibarri, about whom I'll be talking later. Uh, it was, a, from there, it was just a short step to being seen as a whore. Such misogyny was less pre prevalent in the more cosmopolitan areas of the left in Madrid and Barcelona, although even there it was not uncommon. On the right, female independence was heavily frowned upon. The further one travelled from the metropolis, the more acute the problem became. The outbreak of the Spanish Civil War and the need to mobilise society for total war gave women in both zones a dramatically new participation in the functions of both government and society. As in all modern wars, the almost exclusively male preoccupation with, vi with violence created the necessity for women to take over the economic and welfare infrastructure. In the Republican zone, women not only played a crucial role in, in, in industrial production, but also assumed important positions in the political and even military establishment. This was not without its complications. The young, politically committed women who took up arms and went to fight as militia women fought with great courage when they were allowed to do so. However, it was widely assumed by their male comrades that they were best employed in cooking and washing. They were also subjected to considerable sexual pressure, and whether they succumbed to it or not, it was assumed that they were whores. Behind the lines, women ran public services in transport, welfare, and health. That, together with the assumption of the role of principal breadwinner in the family, had a dramatic effect on traditional gender relations. It was short-lived and largely confined to the public sphere. Domestic life was rarely democratized, and women continued to take principal responsibility for cooking, cleaning, and childcare, even as they organized the sinews of war. As the Francoist forces captured Republican territory in the, in the southern provinces in 1936, along the northern coast in 1937, and then all over Spain once the war ended in April 19, on the 1st of April 1939. The feminist revolution of the Second Republic was reversed with extreme savagery. In the reactionary atmosphere of the rebel, so-called nationalist zone, there had been no comparable emancipation of women. 
Although as the story of the Francoist medical services and of the welfare organisation called Auxilio Sotiel shows, even there women were unable to have a public existence hitherto denied them. Nevertheless, the organisation of health and welfare by Auxilio Sotiel and the Section Feminina, the, femi the women's section of the Falange, would be short-lived. The ideological thrust of the Franco regime was to stress women's roles as homemakers and baby factories for phalangist warriors. Republican women were punished for their brief escape from gender stereotypes by humiliations both public and private. They were dragged through the streets after having their heads shaved, being tarred and feathered, or forced to ingest castor oil and thus soil themselves in public. In nationalist prisons they were beaten and tortured. Sexual humiliation ranged from being paraded naked by a sexual harassment to rape and murder. Generalised punishments for the gender libera liberation provided by the Republic. The propaganda that denounced all left-wing women as whores justified this. Those who came out of prison alive suffered deep, lifelong physical and psychological problems. For most Republican women, there were also the terrible economic and psychological problems of having their husbands, fathers, brothers and sons murdered or forced to flee. Often wives were arrested in efforts to get them to reveal the hiding places of their menfolk. In contrast, despite frequent uh, assumptions that the raping of nuns was common in Republican Spain, there was rel relatively little equivalent abuse of women there. That is not to say that it did not take place. The sexual molestation of around one dozen nuns and the deaths of 296 nuns, just over 1.3% of the female clergy, is shocking, but of a notably lower order of magnitude than the fate of women in the rebel zone. That is not entirely surprising, given that respect for women was built into the Republic reforming programme. The women about whom most is known were the middle-class female intelligentsia. Although that situation is changing, relatively little is still known of the role of less well-educated working-class women in war production, as nurses, even as soldiers, as farm labourers and as factory workers, often in appalling conditions of toxicity, running buses and trams in towns, as teachers in literacy campaigns at the front, as well as continuing to, to provide food and laundry for the men. The repression of the imprisoned and tortured working class women who were unable to escape into exile is also <coughs> difficult to, to reconstruct, since often the humiliations to which these women were subjected made them reluctant to relive their experiences with interviewers. Now I'm sorry, that's a very brief overview, uh, which I thought was worth making. Uh, obviously one could talk at much greater length, but I hope it will give you, as I say, a, a, a brief overview uh, of what happened to women uh, in, in Spain in the 1930s.